Hello and welcome to Asset TV's Asia Focus Masterclass with me, Mark Colgate. In this show, we are bringing together some of the top asset managers and gatekeepers in the region. We've got panelists joining us from Tokyo, Singapore, and Hong Kong, and they're going to be giving us their views and insights on what's going on in the most dynamic part of the global economy. I'm going to come to them in a moment. I just want to mention the structure of this. It's a bit different from our typical masterclass. What we're going to be doing is three 20 minute sessions, one after the other. We're going to start with a little look at ESG. We're going to move on to a look at emerging Asia in the round, both perspectives on equities and bonds. And we're going to finish with a particular focus on China and North Asia. So that's the structure for the day. Um, without any further ado, let's get things straight underway with our first session. We're going to be looking at shareholder value and ESG integration in Asia. So let's bring in our panelists. Joining us from Hong Kong is Rahul Chadha. He's CIO at Mirai Assets Global Investments. And we're joined from Singapore by Simon Coxeter, Growth Markets Director of Strategic Research at Mercer. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Rahul, let's start with you. As CIO, how important is ESG to your job compared to, say, five or ten years ago? Mark, if we see the journey of ESG, more so in Asia, EMs, over the last five, ten years, um, five years back or um, seven years back, it was largely about S, which is the social part of it. It was about the G, which is the governance part of it. That too seen in patches. Um, I mean, the leading companies across countries like India, etc. But now it's a lot more broad-based. Now you're seeing um, a particular focus on E in last two, three years. Now you're seeing close to 60, 70% of the companies um, kind of following it, making active disclosures on that. Um, you're seeing stock exchanges uh, mandating the companies to come with um, higher disclosures on ESG front. Uh, from Mere Asset as a firm perspective, six, seven years back, we were signatories to UNPRI. We had these standardized one size fits all scorecards uh, for the companies under a coverage. So what's happened over the last 12, 18 months is the scorecards become a lot more bespoke, um, more customized, more focused on the environment part of it. So, so I think it's become a lot more detailed. It's, it's holding companies to accountability now. So that's the change uh, and the journey over the last 10 years. Thank you. And Simon, how big a part in your role does ESG and sustainability play? Thanks, Mark. So um, my role at Mercer is focused on two main areas. Firstly, manager research, where um, we evaluate on behalf of our clients the investment strategies or funds offered by asset management firms. Um, and sustainability is really integral to our uh, manager research process. And we've been uh, assigning explicit ESG ratings to strategies for well over a decade now, uh, recognizing the importance of sustainability to, to investment outcomes to our clients. And secondly, I'm involved in what we call strategic research, which really covers a wide range of investment topics. I, I'm not a specialist in sustainable investment, but sustainability has long been a, a critical part of our global investment beliefs that really guide our approach to, to helping clients with their, their investment programs. Because we believe that asset owners are, are more likely to create and preserve capital uh, and actually meet their objectives by taking a sustainable uh, approach. But beyond those areas of manager and strategic research, I'd say that ESG and sustainability is really um, part of our DNA across our business and the different ways we support uh, investors. And Simon, just to dig into that a little bit, where's this drive that you've both mentioned on ESG and sustainability coming from? Is it, is it coming out of local markets? Is it something that is comes along with pools of capital from the West and, and, and has a sort of ripple effect? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of drivers. I think there are top-down and bottom-up drivers all the way from governments, regulators and investors down to the individual consumers and their evolving preferences. And I think in some areas like the environment, there's a growing awareness that Asia uh, could be very badly impacted by, by climate change. And, and much of Asia's population and economic output is in coastal megacities. Um, you know, so sea levels are a big issue, for example. Uh, so this really focuses the minds of um, a broad range of stakeholders in the region. And for Asia in particular, it's probably fair to say that uh, a green transition is existential rather than uh, some sort of abstract uh, exercise in helping the planet. 
And Rahul, when you're looking at this as, as an asset manager, how do you start to factor some of these big picture issues into individual stock decisions? I mean, for example, Simon mentioned things like rising sea level. How do you take that, start to think through what the implications are, and then work out whether that's helping you to, pri- you know, whether an asset is priced correctly or, you know, the right amount of risk is built in? Well, absolutely. I think, I think as Simon alluded to, this is a challenge one faces or sees on a day-to-day level when interacting with our portfolio companies. An example I'll give here is uh, one of the purpose we've invested in India and largely operating in the national capital region in Delhi. Now, the problem Delhi has is falling water tables. Uh, this developer, uh, which is one of the leading developers in India, has a significant land bank in that area. But look, if the water tables continue to fall, that land bank is of no use. So, so um, last couple of years, our engagement with the with this developer has been, what are you doing to do the rainwater harvesting? What are you doing to maintain these water tables, etc.? Uh, but clearly, this this is one example. And what we see is this um, unseasonal rains, whether it's China, India, um, parts of India which were we used to. At very minimal rain, like Gujarat, etc., West are getting drought, uh, are getting floods, etc., in totally unexpected times. So I think that's something one do, uh, does at all points of time, engages with the companies, interacts with them. That what is their part towards uh, growing while reducing their carbon footprint, etc. And to your broader question, see, we try to reassess uh, the hit to our portfolio from, let's say, a climate um, adverse uh, a rise of four degrees Celsius. And what I would say is the funds we manage would have less than 5% impact. So we are doing all kind of studies and we would be kind of sharing that in coming months with our investors that look, what is the adverse impact of a climate um, increase of 4 to 5% in our portfolios. And how easy is it, Rahul, to, to ask one of your underlying companies and to get them to deliver the data that you need? Because this must be, you know, I'm sure most companies are used to providing annual reports and accounts, but all of this extra data that, shareholders are now starting to ask for. That, 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 that must take time to plumb in, build, build acceptable standards, build on previous year's work. Absolutely, Mark. I, I think that's the painstaking part of the whole process. And that's where our approach of using ESC as an integrated part of our investment strategy works well. Each of our analyst portfolio managers has ESG integration as a part of his key KPIs for the year. Um, we we kind of um, the ESG specialists along with the uh, senior team members, which includes me, we decide on the key three four KPIs for the whole investment team. And the idea is to work with these companies to ensure their disclosures are aligned with the TFFD uh, TCFD disclosures to ensure that these companies are working towards um, uh, whatever reducing the carbon footprint. Uh, but the key starting point is um, great, uh, greater disclosures. Uh, see, most companies used to give scope one emissions. I think the idea is to move towards scope two emissions and scope three emissions. So, so disclosures is the first uh, and the most important starting point. So what are your thoughts on that? Because I, I guess as part of a global company in Mercer, you can see, I guess, best and worst practices from around the world. Rahul made some great points there. And I think what it really underpins to us is the value of active management. There are uh, a lot of disparities between um, you know different vendors ESG data uh, kicking the tires and, and exercising judgment is really important in interpreting what is you know often very complex and sometimes conflicting data uh, and and really although there's obviously a role for passive and low cost uh, investments in investor portfolios when it comes to ESG active management can really shine. Uh, in added value. So when you're looking at, as you mentioned, you're, you you also take help in the fund selection. When you're looking there, what's your thoughts on whether asset managers in the region are using third-party services to, to, to score their ESG? Or, or is it important for you that they're doing it in-house and it's very much integrated with the day-to-day activities of the, you know, the, the analysts and the fund managers, as Rahul was saying, that they do at Mirai? Definitely the, the third-party data has value. Uh, and we see many of the asset managers leveraging uh, the increasing amount of data that's available externally. But from a ma- as a manager perspective, where they can really add value is with that proprietary research and in interpreting to interpreting that data, and also going deeper into some of these issues and really leveraging their particular expertise on that sector in that market. Uh, to sort of make informed judgments about what are, you know, often very complex decisions. 
And Rahul, when you, you're talking to an investment or a potential investment, I'm sure they tell you that if you're interested in ESG, they're passionate about it too. But uh, what are some of the things that you look for in a company that tells you they're serious? See, you've got to see whether these companies walk the talk or not. See, right now, the companies also know what investors want. So, so they, most of them, 90% of the universe would be speaking the right language. But like the way you rightly kind of had asked, uh, it's very important that your actions uh, meet um, the top. So, so again, we're willing to give companies time. We're willing to give companies two, three years. But you need to see some certain milestones being achieved. And we've seen those examples where companies have spoke uh, spoken about doing the right things, but never really followed on those actions. And that's where we kind of an, uh, walk the talk, where we've divested those holdings. So I think that's where we showcase to our stakeholders that, look, these are the companies, despite these companies being the leading business models, despite them having huge headroom for growth, we've divested these names um, because they never followed on their ESG or the good governance promise. At the same time, um, I think um, to, to what Simon said, what we've seen is most of the independent data providers fail to give an, um, good data for mid-small cap companies. So that's where the proprietary data sets, which companies like Mire have work very well. Um, we work with these companies, and a good example which comes to mind is a leading Indian cement company where we saw a huge discrepancy between data which was provided by an independent provider and what this company was giving in its annual report or giving in its uh, quarterly statements. And then we took it up with the company to make sure they update the independent data provider because there was a significant disconnect. So I think that's the handholding we active managers do, and that's where we can we can create huge value uh, by engagement uh, from um, moving towards bettering the ESG perspective. And so we talk about Asia; it's a vast region. It's absolutely huge. As you look across it, um, where is the whole region in the same place on its on its ESG journey, if I can call it like call it that, or are there some very obvious differences depending on where you are? There are definitely differences across. We talk about Asia as sort of a homogenous block quite often, but in reality, it's it's really very diverse. And you know, the 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 individual markets are at different stages of development. Um, the regulatory environment is different across many of these markets, which you know creates challenges but opportunities as well. Um, so you know, although the the direction of change in all of the markets really has been positive over the last few years. There are, you know, significant differences um, to, 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 to the different sort of idiosyncrasies of the individual markets. And you mentioned regulators, Simon. Um, where do the regulators come from? Is it a sort of ever moving global elite that sort of move from from state to state, um, or, or sort of copying each other? Are there, is it very much more bottom up? How, how's that sort of environment infrastructure building out? Well, we, we see increasing collaboration between governments and regulators, looking at different regions, looking at the sort of best practices in other regions. There's a lot that can be learned from each other that way. And that also helps with one of the key issues really, which is consistency. And I'm sure Rahul has have some sort of views on this in terms of um, the lack of a sort of standardized taxonomy within this space. Uh, this collaboration can really help uh, with sort of supranational uh, organizations like the Asian Development Bank uh, getting more involved and other organizations to create more harmonization uh, across markets and the approach to ESG and the categorizations and, and regulations involved. Um, so, yeah, th there's a lot of positive change going on. Well, you, Rula, I'm interested in your, your response to that. So I think uh, similar to what Simon said, uh, see, uh, in the last two years, we've seen a significant regulatory action towards a harmonized uh, taxonomy. Uh, so you've seen what's come from Hong Kong Stock Exchange, you've seen what's come from China. These guys have taken steps towards uh, reducing the greenwashing, which was happening more for fixed income, some equities, et cetera. What they've come out with is clear norms that look like if you are heavy polluters, you've got to come up with clear plans towards uh, reducing the carbon footprint. You've got to come up with a clear plan towards ESG improvement, engagement, et cetera. That's well approved by the board. So a lot of those things are happening. Um, safe to say that, look, most of the Asian regulators are following what's happening in Europe. So Europe is leading. But even if Europe, if uh, you look at, 
um things are not very clear about uh, some of the taxonomy topics uh, so so i think there is fair bit of a discussion over there that should we include nuclear or gas as a clean fuel or not so there are a lot of these debates and it's fair to think about it uh, before before firming up one's view uh, but look uh, we are moving in the right direction and i think that's what matters that uh, are we heading in the right direction one knows that these are not easy topics uh, but that's where we've got to give the whole ecosystem whether it's companies whether it's our end users or investors some time to get around this and at mirai are you on the back of everything we've talked about are you finding this is beginning to impact on the ret- the risk returns that come off your portfolios and also the, the the period that you invest in stocks for if you think it's doing something that you know long term is long term is a very good idea but perhaps it's not necessarily showing in the financials over the next 18 months, two years. How does that alter perhaps some of the things that are happening in portfolios? So absolutely, Bhanta. That's a that's question we get um, asked quite often. That look, uh, does following ESG or the highest standards of ESG mean compromising your returns? Um, I gave you a couple of examples where we've divested good names and had attractive valuations because those companies didn't follow the promise of ESG. At the same time, if, you, if you're willing to give it time uh, from a five, seven years perspective, there are enough stocks where you can create enormous value for your stakeholders through ESG. Example I took was this Indian cement company, which has been a four-bagger for us. We've engaged with some of the um, resource companies across the region where these companies are working towards higher recycling, reducing their carbon footprint, and they've done well in terms of the multiple re-rating. So I think there's a significant value which can be created by working particularly with young companies, the mid-small cap companies. Um, the returns may be a bit back-ended, but look, uh, what it does is it institutionalizes the whole setup, et cetera, and it makes their business a lot more robust. And Simon, I suppose a bit of a conventional view in the West that you know a lot of the ideas around ESG and sustainability have come out of Scandinavia and have then sort of cascaded across the rest of Europe and into North America and sort of slowly working their way the whole way around the world. But um, that, that's a very sort of perhaps London-centric view of the world. From, from where you're sat, what are some of the sources of re- really interesting developments in ESG and sustainability that are coming out of Asia and are heading back in the other direction? Well, I, I think if you look from a bottom-up perspective, it, there's a lot of innovation taking place in Asia. Um, highly educated workforces, um, a lot of investment and research going into areas like alternative energy. Um, There will undoubtedly be uh, sort of sharing of some of that expertise going forward um, to to other regions. So I think Asia is actually driving uh, innovation that'll drive some of the solutions to some of the problems that we're really talking about. Um, over the next uh, few decades. And of course, Asia is also um, highly threatened by some of these risks as well. So there's an imperative there. And um, I suppose the other one, uh, Simon, as you're looking at it, we talked, I alluded at the start perhaps to sort of pools of capital coming from the West to Asia, but as Asia becoming phenomenally wealthy, sort of how are some of those Asian pools of capital being directed? I think you mentioned the Asian Development Bank. Um, a little earlier. And what, what are some of the main concerns there? Are they E, S or G? Um, across the board, really. I mean, historically in Asia, the, the main concern was always governance. And I think, as Rahul sort of alluded to earlier, that has uh, spread out across social and environmental factors over the last sort of decade quite, quite rapidly. Um, in terms of the pools of capital, um, with many of the fastest growing retirement systems across Asia and, and greater levels of wealth and, and financial market development, um, this region is really likely to become an increasingly important source of capital globally. So Asian investors will have a big role to play in shaping sustainability over the coming decades. And that really impacts companies not just in this region, but also elsewhere um, around the world uh, as Asian investors invest more outside the region. Thank you. And uh, Rahul, from your perspective, are you, are you worried at all there could be a bit of a green bubble brewing up? H- how do you avoid uh, getting your investors' capital sucked into things that um, might not deliver? Okay. So I think that's a fair point. So that's, that's where I think I integrated approach to ESG work. Look, uh, ESG for us 
is as important as looking at the long-term competitiveness of the business, as looking at the valuations, the underlying risk reward, um, the downside um, to the business once we are buying it. So, so I think that's that's where one's got to be disciplined. Um, following ESG doesn't mean buying companies at any valuations. Uh, like the way I said, you've got to keep your valuation criteria, you've got to keep your downside risk also um, in mind while, while you're building your exposures on those companies. And uh, what we're talking about is there was a bit of a frothiness in the direct impact part of uh, the business, which was the EVs, et cetera. But outside that, which is about 80% of our portfolio, which is engagement with the companies, you can find so many attractive business models. And look, engagement is a more painstaking process. Each of the investment team members got to work with that relevant company for three to four years, but the rewards are huge. Uh, so it takes longer, but uh, like the way, um, you have a lower downside there and um, returns are huge. Thank you. Now, we're almost out of time on this session. So I want to get a final thought from each of you. Uh, if there's one key point around ESG in Asia you want to leave us with, what would that be? Simon, can I come to you on that first? Well, I think I think it's easy to get overwhelmed with the challenges and, and complexities of the, the sustainability space, given the rapid change and, and also because it does take many investors outside their sort of historical comfort zone in terms of expertise. Uh, but even putting aside the existential imperatives for the, for the human race, it's really critical we don't underestimate the huge opportunities for all uh, stakeholders in the fiduciary value chain to really position themselves to benefit from a, a well thought out approach to sustainability. Rahul. So again, ESG is the need of the hour. That's that's what the Gen Z wants. That's that's what the millennials want, and that's what uh, we need to do if if we want to urbanize and reap the benefits of the Asian consumption from a longer term. Uh, from our side, the the best approach to kind of an, uh, having this ESG or the right ESG is through engagement. Um, so that's that's what we are focusing on, rather than have silos of ESG specialists. Have an integrated approach where we work with our companies, um, enabling them to grow while reducing the pressure on the system. We have to leave it there. Rahul Chatter and Simon Coxter, thank you for joining us. Thank you.